Last year, a pretty amazing thing happened at a lab in New York's Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. A robot demonstrated self-awareness for the first time. Here's some footage. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's from next year. This is what happened. Which pill did you receive? The experiment worked like this. It's called the wise man test. So they took three robots and programmed them all to believe that two of them had been given a dumbing pill, meaning that they weren't be able to speak. But they didn't know which two had the pill, and then they were asked to guess which one did. I don't know. Sorry, I know now. I was able to prove that I was not given a dumbing pill. The robot answered, and then realized that because it could answer, it couldn't have been the one that got the pill. This is something no computer or robot has ever been able to do before. Computers are able to do awesome things, as we all know, but some of the most basic stuff, like our conscious experience, is something that computers have never been able to demonstrate before. So is our conscious experience just a product of powerful enough computing, or is there something special in our brains that goes beyond computer processing? Patreon patron Luke Swift asked, is consciousness purely algorithmic and computational? If not, then what implications could discoveries have that prove otherwise? Artificial intelligence has grown by leaps and bounds in the last few years, as demonstrated by the computer AlphaGo beating a world-class Go champion earlier this year. These are not small things. It was always believed that if you could combine the computational power of computers with the intelligence and creativity of a human mind, you would be capable of creating an intelligence that could solve all of our problems, or wipe us off the face of the earth. It's worth the risk. One of the pioneers in consciousness research is Sir Roger Penrose. He is the Emeritus Rouse Ball Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford and spent his early career tackling cosmological questions relating to general relativity such as the Cosmic Censorship Hypothesis and the Whale Curvature Hypothesis. He's been awarded the Eddington Medal of the Royal Astronomy Society and the Wolf Foundation Prize for Physics, both of which he shared with Stephen Hawking and in 1994, he was knighted for his contributions to the world of science. Beginning in the late 1980s, he began to turn his attention toward the questions of consciousness and trying to figure out from a mathematical and physics perspective what kind of processes might be creating the conscious experiences we have. He's written two books on the subject, including The Emperor's New Mind, Concerning Computers, Minds, and the Laws of Physics, and Shadows of the Mind, A Search for the Missing Science of Consciousness. Awesome books, links downstairs. By the way, Dr. Penrose is still around and just released a brand new book at 84 years old. Good show, old chap. The main point that Penrose makes, and the point that's gotten him the most notoriety, is his assertion that consciousness cannot be explained by conventional physics as we know it. He believes that the structure and function of neurons simply doesn't hold the computational power necessary to create the experience of consciousness that we all have. He argues that there must be something else going on, something even smaller, and he argues that that's taking place in the quantum space. So along comes Stuart Hameroff, an anesthesiologist who became intrigued by Roger Penrose's work. Now this isn't really surprising because anesthesiologists are really the only doctors that deal with consciousness on a daily basis because it's their job to turn that consciousness off. In fact, I listened to a podcast from the guys at Stuff You Should Know, which is a great podcast you guys should check out, and they talked about anesthesia, and it scared the crap out of me because it turns out they don't really know how anesthesia works because they still don't know how consciousness works. Basically, they just know that it works, and they give you just enough of it to knock you out without, you know, killing you. Oh, and then they got into these stories about how there are some people who have gone into surgery, but it turns out that they didn't completely lose consciousness. They basically just became paralyzed so they could still feel and hear and experience everything that was going on, but they couldn't do anything about it because they were trapped in their bodies and they all came out with this sort of like PTSD afterwards. And it just made me never want to have surgery again. So, duh. so there you go. Now you're as traumatized as I am. Anyway, Hameroff brought to Penrose this idea that there are these tiny little structures in our neurons called microtubules, and he believed that these microtubules may hold the key to allowing the brain to compute in quantum space. 
Microtubules make up the cytoskeleton of our neurons and kind of hold it all together, and they're tiny, just nanometers across. But Hameroff believed that there were spaces inside of those tubules that allowed for qubits, or quantum bits of information, to communicate with each other. Working together, they created the ORC-OR model of consciousness, which states that consciousness in the brain comes from processes inside the neurons instead of from the connections of the neurons themselves. Now, a lot of people, including this bozo, have tried to tie this model into spiritual concepts, saying that ORC-OR would allow the brain to communicate with outside consciousnesses. This is a very popular and controversial interpretation. But I think it's important to point out that Penrose himself is an atheist. Now, he has no interest in proving God or souls or spirituality or anything like that. Just as a physicist and mathematician, he doesn't think the brain is capable of computing enough to make the conscious experience that we have, that there must be something else involved, at least not through the physical understanding that we currently have of the brain. This is known as the hard problem of consciousness. Interestingly, in 2014, at the National Institute for Material Science in Japan, showed that they found quantum vibrations in microtubules, which some proponents of ORCOR believe is evidence in favor of the model. Now this theory is hotly contested with many scientists claiming that the brain is too warm, wet, and noisy for any kind of quantum coherence to take place. This has become known as the warm, wet, and noisy argument. So is the brain purely computational or is there something else going on? As AI research continues, we're finding that it's not just about computational power, it's about neural networks. I'm actually reading a book on this topic right now that's absolutely fascinating. It's called Who's in Charge? Free Will and the Science of the Brain. I'll put a link down in the description below. It's a fascinating book. It's written by a guy who's dealt over 20 years with people who have split brains. As you know, our brains have two hemispheres, the right and left hemisphere, and they're connected by a bundle of fibers in the middle called the corpus callosum. And in some patients, starting back in the 1970s, that had repeated grand mal seizures, like on a daily basis, that made, that made it so that they couldn't you know, function, they started splitting that corpus callosum. They were cutting that bundle of fibers and separating the two hemispheres, which worked to stop their seizures, but it was creating some really interesting side effects. So for example, the visual cortex usually lies in the left hemisphere of the brain. So when they split their vision and showed them a picture of a chicken in their right eye, they literally didn't think they were seeing anything because their brain didn't have the processing ability to let them know that there was something there. But when they put a pencil in their left hand, their hand would draw a picture of a chicken. And then when they asked them, why did you draw a picture of a chicken? They would rationalize it in some way by saying like, I ate chicken yesterday, so I guess that's why. We also have a number of subconscious modules that are semi-conscious in and of themselves inside our minds that make decisions and make us take actions before our conscious mind can decipher why we're doing it. Like if you were taking a walk and you saw the grass rustle, you would jump out of the way immediately, just reflexively, without even realizing you're doing it because millions of years of evolution have taught us to jump out of the way of something like a snake. But it's only after you do it that your conscious mind jumps in and says, oh, that might have been a snake and I could have been bitten, that's why I jumped. The story here is that what we perceive as a unified conscious experience is actually several conscious modules inside our head making decisions for us and then an interpreter module that rationalizes the decisions that we make. In other words, our conscious experience is kind of just an illusion. So for now, the answer to the hard problem of consciousness is out of our reach. But as we continue to make progress in the areas of artificial neural networks and quantum computing, we may be on the cusp of some really revelatory stuff in the next few years. So stay tuned. Last week I did a more personal video that was about the Dallas shootings that took place literally a few blocks from where I live. You guys had some great comments about it, I just wanted to call them out real quick. Eli Rudder said, your subscriber base may be small compared to other channels, but make no mistake, you have a huge impact. Thanks Eli, that means a lot to me. That's actually something I've had to work on quite a bit, is not be so worried about how big the channel is, and to just try to provide valuable stuff for the people who do follow me. Like you, and I appreciate that. Pranav Dada said, Joe, you don't look like you're 40 years old. You look more like you're in your late 30s. I'm hiding my gray pretty well these days. Eric Etter asked, Joe, were you in Limitless? No, but true story, I actually wrote a movie called Unlimited, which you can find out there. I'll put a link down below. Arifur Raman said, hello again, Joe. I haven't been quite following you around as I said I would. Then who's that that's been behind me this whole time?
Ben Phillips said, Joe, get some sleep. This is just what the late 30s look like. T with grief said, the American culture is ill. These things will just happen more and more. Get used to it. All right, well, there's the grief. Can I have some tea now? Big thanks to Luke Swift. He asked this question as a Patreon patron, and so I get to answer this question for him, and it was a great question. It took me a little bit longer to answer it than I meant to because I really wanted to do it right. But I really appreciate your support, Luke. If you guys want to support the channel on Patreon and any other creators out there, it's uh, patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Obviously, other creators have different names. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you have a question, please ask it down in the comments below. If this is the first time you're watching this channel, I would ask you to subscribe because I come back with stuff like this every single Monday. Thumbs up and share if you liked it. Thank you guys so much. Have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next time. Love you guys.